hello, my name is uh, Alex, and I'm, I'm an engineer at the Plum Grid. And today, I hope we'll have a productive discussion on the OVS and BPF extensions proposal that uh, were submitted to the mailing list last week. So to start, I need to go back a little bit to explain why uh, we're doing all of this. Uh, current applications demand a rich set of virtual network functions. And what we call a virtual network function is a bridge, in this case, router, NAT, DHCP, and so on. Uh, we believe that they need to be easily deployable and distributable across hypervisors. Uh, today, uh, distributed virtual bridge is not a novelty. VMware did it in the past, others have done it. Uh, what we want to do, we want to have a, a distributed router that routes the packet between uh, two VMs on the leftmost uh, hypervisors and the router in the middle. In the same way, it routes, it forwards the packet across the hypervisor. More than that, we want to have a virtual distributed, distributed, that's the key point here, virtual NAT that scales proportionally to the number of hypervisors in the, in the data center. Uh, achieving uh, scalability in a data center obviously is not easy. It's an iterative process. To some degree, it's evolution of both control plane and data plane. Uh, Plus, when you have a data center and you keep evolving and expanding, you're inventing new uh, functions, new features, uh, you don't want your uh, hypervisors to be rebooted while you're doing it, while you're upgrading, fixing bugs. So uh, can we sustain this agility of the development in a current SDN architecture? So uh, vertically integrated networking stack is a norm. Um, data plane is your uh, open with switch, uh, Intel DPDK, NetMap, Broadcom ASICs, and so on. Some of them are closed source, some of them are open. Controller is not necessarily open flow controller only. Uh, it existed long ago, like iOS, Juno OS, they are controllers, and the network functions are the bridges, firewalls, and load balancers that were developed on top of it. Uh, Physical network infrastructure providers uh, develop them all and sell us as one piece. SDN vendors, at the same time, they share today uh, the data plane, which is OVS, open flow, hardware based, uh, uh, or hardware, hardware capable open flow. Uh, uh, but What, 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 makes it, what makes it really uh, the same is that at the same time when, when you look at it, the, um, it's not really about open or closed source. All of these pieces can be open, some of them closed source. And you can take any of them and develop the stuff on top. But what if uh, somebody else uh, needs to develop a new feature uh, that doesn't exist in a controller? Uh, if it's a new and unexpected feature, most likely controller and data plane don't have the APIs to support it. Uh, there is a network service header discussions um, that are popping up. The probably will be in the same conference. Uh, what if somebody comes up with APV7? Uh, how we want to do this support in the existing, in existing network structure or network analytics? For the, if external company or university wants to develop a network function, it's hard for them to justify, the, first of all, the business investment in uh, kernel hacking of uh, OVS, then extending some controller, or worse, convincing an SDN vendor to do it. And what about if these extensions are not uh, necessarily seen uh, beforehand, like dynamic data plane extensions. If you want to do, uh, let's say, network analytics, where the user specify the rules, and we want to dynamically compile a certain piece inside the data plane that will be monitoring, monitoring the traffic, like uh, existing filters, but more advanced. One approach would be to think of everything possible and put everything in data plane. That would be hard to do, obviously. Uh, our proposal is to let 
network function developers access data plane directly from the control plane. The idea, the main idea here is to get the controller out of the way. Controller shouldn't interfere with the data plane control plane interaction as long as functions that are running in both data plane and control plane are sandboxed and safe for hypervisor and other tenants. Let function developers compete with each other. Well, in Plumgrid we do have a distributed virtual bridge, but we want other people to develop new ones, even better ones, and build them on top of the controller out of the way platform and sell it too. In this particular case, the focus uh, on the data plane. Uh, everything that's being loaded in data plane uh, should be, as I said, safe. It shouldn't crash the kernel. It shouldn't compromise each other. It shouldn't affect other tenants who are running on the same hypervisor. From, and if you think about it, it helps the developers of the bridge routers and so on, the future network functions that we cannot even envision, to, be, uh, to remove the complexity of uh, having to deal with the kernel, kernel, kernel all the time. So um, this concept is actually high level, con uh, very high level, and the patches that you've seen uh, on the mailing list is a particular implementation of these ideas in the uh, kernel um, that we'd like to get the feedback on. So what this generic data plane can be? Uh, our first idea was let's just load the code directly. We'll compile it in user space, make sure the compiler in user space will check that, uh, will guarantee that the code is correct, it won't break the kernel, we'll just load it directly. So it will be kprobe-like functionality uh, loading stuff. But then uh, what we found out, the compiler itself, uh, when we keep working at compiler itself, maybe it's, it's hard for the kernel to justify that the correctness of the kernel and its safety is relying on the user space. So we moved on to the next step. Then we added the uh, x86 disassembler with a full uh, uh, static analyzer of x86, of x86 code to make sure that this part is safe. Uh, that also obviously doesn't, is not generic enough because x86 is not the only platform we want to support. The last thing is that we tried for BPF. So uh, what is BPF? Kernel coding is hard, um, and things like OVS up call, uh, net filters queues, uh, moving, moving the complexity into the user space. And the BPF filter is, to some degree, is a way to bridge the gap. Yes? Um clear for, because I'm, I'm not sure if it is clear to the folks in the room, that what you're talking about is a generalization of sort of the existing match action look up, look up and, and action. Um, because you're describing it, you, you gave the, uh, we need a more extensible data plane, but I'm not sure if it was entirely clear that the, that that's sort of, it, it's that core mechanism of, of match and action that's currently limiting and that you're, that's the problem you're trying to address. Is that right? Correct, correct. Later, exactly. So that's, that's exactly the case. Later, I will have examples to show what can be this uh, little data plane blocks are. Uh, but to get an overview, I had to go with a, uh, with a BPF. So uh, the BPF filters today, they're bridging the gap between the uh, kernel and the user space. Today, the filters, the filters just doing this little bit of filtering before user space need to do the work. So uh, this is just one of the examples. So what if these filters can do a little bit more than they are today? The way we are extending them, uh, we're saying filters now, not just instructions, but instructions plus the tables. And the table is just the key value, key value storage. And that accessible both from user space, user space and kernel space. As the filters, as instruction sets itself, uh, it was developed and invented long ago when 32-bit processors were the norm. Now, 64 is the rule of the world. Even the phones will have a 64-bit ARMs running. So, uh, plus two registers uh, was really, really limiting to have a useful and generic, generic program to uh, run on top. 
then uh, the program by itself will be hard to use if it doesn't do, doesn't call into the helpers. Uh, today, the existing BPF implementation, when the code is just in time compiled on Spark, x86, and other architectures, it's actually already using function calls to implement load bytes from the packet. To do a lookup from the packet, it is a function call. In this approach, we're generalizing it by saying uh, there is a simple um, ABI, uh, certain register, return register, argument passing register, and the rest is a uh, Kali saved, meaning that when the program is calling into the helper function, uh, it knows that the register will not be uh, corrupted. Uh, why the set of why it was picked this way? We've looked at the um, x86, uh, pretty much 64 bit architectures that I'm familiar with, uh, which is Spark, um, Spark V9, X86, uh, ARM64, uh, MIP64, and this is to some degree a subset of the registers and operations that can be easily uh, jitted to the target, to the target, tar target CPU. Uh, the examples of this helper function calls, uh, same uh, like load, byte, load, half, load, word that exist today plus extending them with a store byte and forwarding. So, so far pretty simple. Uh, then on the bottom you can see uh, the BPF uh, instructions written in the similar mnemonics as they were, as they were before. Uh, the only thing that existed uh, in early days, you'd have to uh, write your BPF in assembler, which is to some degree this mnemonic is assembler to me. Uh, sophisticated tools like Wireshark were, could generate things, but now with, a, with having a restricted C and GCC backend for it, you can write these little programs uh, in C, which makes it a lot more easier, a lot more easier to understand. Uh, the most important part of this extension is obviously correctness and the safety. Uh, but it looks like I'm uh, running out of time, so uh, I can spend the whole hour on it, but I would rather uh, move it after the conferences. After the conference, if we have uh, time, I will get back to it. So I, I have a question. Basically, you're proposing instead of running code that has been developed in a um, process with code review that we're running binary blobs inside the kernel to implement the data plane, right? Binary blobs. I don't think I understand the question. Like, uh, there is no way for the kernel, aside from making sure that there are no loops, that are no. Uh, yes, there is. Yes, this whole, this whole. Yeah, but there is no check which would ensure that that it's that it's correct beyond um, just not crashing the kernel or not looping forever, right? There is no review in in, in well, yeah, in, no uh, human review yeah. of the code that will will, will run because you are extending it to a point which is way beyond what BPF has been used so far. Well, if you look at BPF, if you write the BPF today, you can read the same byte from the packet 100 times. Is it uh, correct, a useful behavior? If the author of that BPF filter intended, well, it is correct to him. So same approach is here. If you want to read from the packet 10 times true, let it read it. If you want to call a lookup function 10 different times on the same MAC address, let's say, let it call it 10 times. So in terms of the flow, in terms of uh, deterministic execution of the filter is still the same. So I'm not sure I answer in or um, understand the yeah, question. Yeah, I think my question is rather, there is no way of ensuring that however this is implemented in the past. I mean, obviously there will be multiple vendors providing this um, binary blobs that are then, then loaded inside the kernel and run. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very different from what we have right now, which is a well-defined network stack with uh, development principles based on code review, maintainers, and then a, a development model that is built on small bug fixes. And I all see. of that so is, is in this sense, uh, it's actually not corrupting the stack uh, in any way. Uh, meaning, meaning that um, when you modify the packet, if you want to modify the packet, it will modify it within the limits of the uh, existing infrastructure, like uh, the hardware checksumming, the checksum complete, partial, and all of this, all of these bits will stay correct. So, if you corrupted MAC address because you wanted to in the filter, 
not necessarily it's the right behavior from the stack point of view. Maybe it doesn't make sense, but that's what the author wanted to do. So yes, if you're asking like for review of the things that going into the kernel, in this case they're actually not, well, the filters are for the, they're not for the uh, kernel stack. So to some degree here, we're not, the filters is not to deliver packets to do the, um, let's say, uh, TCP defragmentation. So that's definitely not the goal here. It's not to track whether the stack is correct. But the author of the filter is supposed to maintain, uh, supposed to code it in a way that makes sense, obviously. Okay. I'm well, I can understand your argument perfectly. And I'm, I'm trying to tell you that you will, it will not just be me with, the, with that argument. That Right now, it's, it's, it's easy to, to verify what OBS is doing because you can read the code and it's clear. If mm -hmm. you start lo loading BPF programs into, into curl, doing complex stuff like switching, um, mm -hmm. there will be no way for whoever runs that to audit what the code is doing. That's, that, that's correct, but don't you, don't you want that? Don't you, like when you're experimenting with stuff, don't you want to have this flexibility when you can do anything uh, in the fast pass pretty much, but uh, without crashing the kernel, but then you can always open source and review these pieces of the filters. You can, we can have a public repository of them and say this is a correct filter that you can use that's working and this is the one that I'm experimenting. Again, I'm a university, I want to invent my V7 protocol. I want to play with it. I don't want people now to look at my code yet, but I want my safety, so. So you're, you're thinking that this will break the model of OGS and that it becomes kind of non deterministic? I think it, uh, it, the problem I see is in very similar to how firmware is being handled in Inside Side of Kernel. It's, it's something we don't trust entirely. It's, it's, it's something we, can't, we cannot review, so we want to isolate it as, as much as possible. It's, it's perfect if we can validate it from a technical perspective, whether it's safe to run it, but it's not necessarily the same question when it, when it comes to whether we want to make that the default solution, because we will be committing to that kind of interface. Oh, wait, wait, wait. This is not a solution for, this is not a replacement of anything that's currently in the kernel. It's not a replacement for Linux bridge. There's not a replacement for in kernel nuts, in proxy, and everything else, for net filters. Not so it's, a, a, it's not an addition, or how, how, does it, how does it compare to the current OBS data path? Well, maybe then I, uh, then that, I miss that's, that's exactly the next slide. So. Okay, we already have BPF in the kernel. Yes, correct. Yes, so BPF current. Yes, but yeah, let me. It seems like it's, it's OBS, so there's a constraint in this view that this would break. And I think that that is a little bit of a concern of mine that OBS has a very specific model for which the kind of filter you have to be designed for that model. And a generic um, matching of PDF would be make that model not work. Yeah, but you yeah. know. This is just a, a good logical continuation of BPF, and that's one of a zillion different ways of communicating network stuff to and from user space. Right, but but he he he's 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 telling you you can have tools to verify the code, not just people. Isn't that better in general? See, GPL GPL license, sure. As I said, the public repository for all the filters or for the filters that 
we care to load and running hypervisor that is a production hosting some critical VMs, that's all possible, right? Um, license and discussion and openness and correctness of the filters, to, some, to me it's, it's kind of an orthogonal discussion towards versus technology. So yeah. this is a technology. Yeah. And, It seems like this, the current state of affairs is such that BPF is a path to allow a secret sneaking in of, of unreviewed code. I mean, it's tantamount to loading one of the NVIDIA binary blobs if we never tainted the kernel or told anybody about it. I mean, something could go wrong and you'd have no idea what, the, what it was if you didn't have the source code. And there's no guarantee that you'll have the BPF source code for a given filter that you write. Sure. As I, as I said, let's, let's, let's Let's force it, let's force that every program is GPL. That's not a big deal. So like if the concern is about licensing it, it's about openness, what actually being loaded, sure, it's not a problem. But I think I'm really running out of time and I still have a slide. One more presentation, I'd like to create So uh, let me uh, very quickly uh, just, show, just show the flow uh, on the OVS side. What can, be this, uh, what can this BPF program be doing? Uh, in this particular case, this program will be just uh, doing a table lookup on the destination mic. If it's a forward, that's a hit. If it's a miss, it goes to up call. Just with one program, just with one little program that would be easy to review because it's doing single lookup and, and forward, two functions, two functions, two functions that it called, it will solve most, if not all, the problems that we just discussed about OVS. There won't be any up call penalty with one program. This is, this is two hypervisors, two hypervisors on the knees. This is a distributed virtual bridge. Without up call problem, without flow explosion problem, uh, without, uh, without, without KOS issues, without, without DOS attacks, without, and so on and so forth. So, sorry, I ran out of time. <laughs>